hello everybody and welcome to the Google Playhouse. Uh, this is Bobcat Goldthwait. We're gonna have a conversation with him. So uh, I know it's sunny and you're drinking and you wanna ride the margarita bikes, but uh, if I could ask you to sort of turn this way, because this is one funny dude. Oh, um, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> well, I, that's what we're gonna talk about. I was, I was hilarious in the 80s, but uh, 2000s, not so funny. All right, well, let's, let's, no, I, I'm going to start with the director bio that you gave to South by Southwest. Normally, I wouldn't be lame and just reread that, but I can't beat that. So this is the director bio. Bobcat Goldthwait doesn't act much anymore, but has been directing TV shows and independent films for years, which is why you probably thought he was dead. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> is, is my mic on? Yeah, a lot of people um, think I'm dead, but... Um, um, I'm not. <laughs> you know what scares me more is, is when you say a lot of people think you're dead in front of a tent full of people and no one laughs. They go, yeah, we thought you were dead too, man. We we're pretty sure. Yeah, I lost some money on a bet. Oh no, Bob Scratch Goldfarb's alive? <laughs> well, you went, you went from being a very public figure to, you know, being behind the camera for 10 years. So. Yeah, I, I, um, I retired from acting the same time they uh, stopped hiring me. So it worked out really well. That's good. But uh, yeah, I've been behind the scenes. People don't know that, but um, I used to direct the Jimmy Kimmel show. Um, I Back did that. when it was funny? I, uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm not going to get it. I think Jimmy's funny, but I did, um, I did that show for three years, but ABC never promoted that because it was like, hey, hey, you know that guy who's banned from the other talk shows? The guy who set The Tonight Show on fire? Yeah. He's our director, so they kind of they kind of downplayed that a lot. So let, I mean, let's talk about you know fire safety a little bit. <laughs> what did you have against chairs in that period in the nineties? Um, I uh, I was uh, a chair killed my father. No, I um I I yeah I said the Tonight Show on fire, uh, but I didn't say the. T it was just a chair, and then um, I ended up. Uh, I, um, I had to do community service, that was my punishment. I did a series of commercials telling people uh, not to set talk shows on fire. No, I did a series of commercials that were about fire safety, if you want to know the truth. It was super embarrassing. So how, like, who wrote the script for that? The fire marshal in Burbank. And if, if you really want to know, I mean, I make a joke about it like it was like, you know, Hi, I'm Bobcat Goldthwait. If you're ever at a talk show, don't set it on fire. Ah! You know, uh, back to you, McGruff. You know, here, here's your old friend Kelsey Grammer with some safe driving tips. Uh, <laughs> I'm Chris Brown for domestic violence. Uh, so, I think it's funny that they make your crime. You know, what I mean, the, the, whatever. So, um, so I ended up uh, doing this commercial, but the reality of the commercial was it was worse than that. They, they, the commercial was. Uh, and I never talk about this. The commercial was, uh, I'll do it for your lens. It was like, hi, I'm Bobcat Goldthwait. You know, I can switch back and forth. But if you're seriously injured in a fire, you can't. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. <laughs> and so the fire marshal in Burbank saw it. And apparently I did a very uh, sarcastic performance. And he didn't like it. He actually turned down my PSA and I had to reshoot it. He was like, you know, I didn't feel it. I don't know what, <laughs> you know, like the Burbank Fire Marshal wants to direct. He goes, you know, I needed an eight, and you just phoned that one in. You gave me a six. So I had to do it again. I guess maybe the first time I was like, hi, I'm Bob Keck Goldway. Fire's bad. So uh, I think some of these people think I'm an arsonist. Uh, I, I wasn't really an arsonist. I was more of a, uh, I think I was just really fed up with being um, kind of famous, but for, for being notorious, you know, and I think I was intentionally trying to sabotage my career. We get, I'm sorry about going all actor studio on you. No, you I can, do I can, I can be I, can be I haven't seen you in a long time, Timmy. You look like Charles Lipton a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to touch know, that one. I, uh, do these good folks know that you're a hell of a rock and roller? I don't know, but just for... There's a great band uh, called Too Much Joy that Tim was a, a leader of, and it's, uh, it really is a great band, and uh, that's how we met. I, I actually didn't even know you. I heard your song, 
And I loved it so much, I put it in my fine alcoholic clown opus. The Citizen Kane of alcoholic clown movies. And that's, and that's, um, and that's how we both ended up in a, in a tent. Yes, yes. And I remember, so, so full I've disclosure. never been to South By before, but um, I'm not sure why they have jars full of pee hanging from a tree. It's a tradition here in Austin. I guess they're helping keeping Austin weird. Yeah. We put feces in jars and hang it in the trees. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> so, so going back to that time, around, so for those who don't know, uh, I think you're on your fifth feature movie? Yeah, this is the fifth movie I made. Um, I make really small personal movies. I don't direct blockbusters. I, 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 um, I don't really have an interest in that. Um, and I just finished a new movie and it's playing here at South by Southwest. It's called God Bless America. And it's a, a, a movie about a guy who's uh, my age, basically. And he's, um, he's, he's pushed over the edge and he actually becomes suicidal. But instead of committing suicide, he sees that show, My Super Sweet 16. So he drives 400 miles and he shoots the girl from My Super Sweet 16 in the face. <laughs> And her classmate sees that and says, did you kill Chloe? And he doesn't say anything. And she's like, awesome. Yeah. And uh, she convinces him that there's so many more people that should be uh, killed that life is worth living. So it's a movie. It's a life reaffirming movie. It's a, it's a very violent movie about kindness. Um, it really is. But um, I did see... I don't want to ruin the movie for you, so I'll just, spoiler alert, stick your fingers in your ears, but a baby may or may not get shot in this movie. Well, actually, I'm, I was going to start with that, because okay. in, in Shakes the Clown, sort of, it very famously begins with Florence Henderson, who America thinks of as Mrs. Brady, uh, sort of hung over, passed out on some clown's bathroom floor, clown, literally, some clown's bathroom floor, she gets woken up basically by being peed on and in the face. No, I get peed on. You get peed on. Florence right. Henderson doesn't get peed on. Okay, I remembered it as Mrs. Brady getting no, peed on. No, I get on. peed on. Okay. That's her contract. It's, okay. uh, Mrs. Brady does not do golden showers. It's right there. It's right there in the paperwork. <laughs> All right, well, Shakes but, the Clown opens with you getting peed on in the face. God Bless America opens with your main character essentially skeet shooting a baby. Yeah. So my, well, qu my first question is... Well, he doesn't skeet shoot it. He points a gun at the mother and some mother throws it in the air and then he shoots it out of the air. But, yeah. um, so, so that leads that to... That baby one... was an asshole. Can I just say that? I mean, I know people are judging me right now, but that kid had a real attitude. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, I... Um, yeah, I kind of like to dig these holes for myself at the very beginning of the movie. And, and, and um, I know it sounds, it, it does sound kind of just jarring, maybe just for shock value, but it actually does kind of set the tone of the movie um, because he's already a guy who's frazzled and pushed over the edge. And, and that's a very Walter Mitty homicidal thought about the screaming baby that constantly has been driving him nuts. Um, but but eventually it, 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 it does turn to real violence in the movie. But it is a satire. I mean, I really, I mean, I really don't have an axe to grind with these people. Like, they, they may or may not run over a group that's loosely based on the Westboro Baptist Church. Well, they look just like them and they have the exact same signs. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I don't really have an axe to grind. The Westboro Baptists, they wrote a, a little thing saying, oh, you would love to kill Reverend Phelps. For those of you who don't know, that's the guy who's like, you know, thank God for dead soldiers and uh, God hates fags, you know, those people. So the characters in our movie um, shoot a couple of them and run over a couple of them. But um, I don't want anyone to really kill those people. I, you know, Frank's thing is that he uh, wants people to be nice, that's all. And... Um, the reason I use those people is just because they're a perfect example of people who use uh, nastiness to promote themselves. You know, I really don't think they, I don't think they care about God at all. They use the Bible the way Kim Kardashian uses her ass. You know, they're just about being famous for no reason at all. 
you know. Yeah. I think with the Westboro Baptist people don't really care about anything other than being famous, you know. Well, I mean, one of the ironies of the movie is that the main character, Frank, throughout the movie, he's giving these sort of moral sermons, lectures, yeah. uh, about how people should be nice to each other and respect one another. The whole time, like, he's drenched in blood, blowing people away on this killing spree. So right. how seriously are we supposed to take his sermonizing? Well, I, I, the things Frank says I do take very serious. Um, it's the, the, here's my point. Like, people are like, you made this violent movie about people being kind. I'm fully aware of that. That you know, and they go, "That's that doesn't make sense." Well, that's ergo the comedy. <laughs> um, if you if you're used to comedies where everything's a punchline, you know, where there's a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, you're not going to like this movie. You're not going to get the comedy. The comedy is that you're not supposed to kill people. So um, that that's the comedy. But I think like. You know, the, the thing is, is that you the... You do a public safety announcement. I'll about have to that. do a public service announcement. That'll be my punishment. Hi, I'm Bobcat Goldway. You know, shooting people that you don't like or get along with is not right. You know, um... <laughs> but, uh, the, um... You know, like, the, the progressive movement and the liberal and all that is... Ve they're very whiny. And, um... And, and they just seem to take whatever is dished out to them. I mean, there's the high-end things where there's people who are very witty, like Jon Stewart and Bill Maher and stuff like that. But for the majority of it, 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 it's... I mean, a thing that really influenced this movie is there's a very popular Tea Party poster that says, we came unarmed this time. And when I saw that poster, I was like, oh, wow. Uh, oh, you want crazy? I'll show you crazy. So I see you're crazy and I raise you crazy. So uh, that's why the, this, this movie is so violent. You, it, this is a very violent movie because if you really think you can hug a Glenn Beck fan into reason, you're out of your mind. Yeah. So in the movie, uh, while Frank and his, his sort of teenage <laughs> accomplice, Roxy, uh, they do tend to limit their killing to folks who seem a lot like Bill O'Reilly and seem a lot like the Westboro Baptist Church people. Yeah. Um, but they also build, they, they have these running lists of people who should be killed or various crimes that you should be killed for, one of which is anyone who gives or receives a high five. Now, I actually, while I was watching the movie, I was like, wait a minute, I returned two high fives yesterday, so explain to me what's worse about that than leaving those people hanging. Well, yeah, they do want, they do think that people, they, but here's the difference. The, that is done, like, I actually think most relationships, uh, a, the basis of a good relationship isn't like liking the same thing. The basis of a good relationship is hating the same thing. And those two just come up with a laundry list of things they dislike, but that's not people they really do think. They don't really want to start shooting people that high five. Uh, I watched the movie recently with a bunch of comedian friends, and they were really enjoying the movie, and they high fived at the beginning of the movie, and I go, oh, they're going to hate the scene coming up. <laughs> She goes, we should kill people that high five. And they're like, oh. But, but eventually, everybody is, is uh, you know, we're all human, you know. So, I mean, that's part of the story. You know, Frank it has these very uh, strident things that he believes in. But even he it, it, it succumbs, you know, and, and, uh, and, and is actually a human being. So, so clearly, I'm not asking people... You know, I don't think Jonathan Swift really wanted people to eat Irish babies. Uh, <laughs> so. So, that, so, you know, I remember when, when you were still doing stand-up comedy and you were touring around, the band was touring around, every once in a while our tours would intersect. We'd come, so I remember seeing a show of yours in Youngstown, Ohio once. I think it was a college crowd. And I was shocked by um, not all of the material was received. Like, you know, you made a lot of people uncomfortable and feel awkward. Um, and it surprised me because these were people who were paying to see you and theoretically knew what they were getting into. <laughs> so I guess how important has it been to you throughout your career to just always be continually as inappropriate as possible? Well, I mean, that's not my goal. It's just that I don't really have a, a good filter. You know what I mean? Like, like, I think like, oh, you like this. Well, you like this. It's from the same brain. Turns out that's not the case. <laughs> and... Um, uh, it, it's, but but I've always and it sounds horrible, 
I've kind of always been interested in entertaining myself first. <laughs> That's not horrible. Well, it's not very lucrative. You know, <laughs> when you go, <laughs> you know what would be funny tonight? If I clean a gut of fish on stage. <laughs> and uh, you would think, oh, whatever. I did that years ago. I, was, I opened up my set. I go, this is the part of the show where I like to clean a gut of fish. And the fish got rancid. I didn't know that, but we had kept it in a sweltering trunk of a car. So it really smelled bad, and I got the fish open, and then all these entrails went out, and this woman immediately vomited in the front <laughs> row. And so I took the mic down, so, and I tried to start interviewing her while she was vomiting. I was like, so what do you do for a living? She's like, uh, do you live around here? Uh. And so then the next comedian had to come out, and there was fish guts and vomit all over the stage. And this guy's act was, Relationships are really weird because men want the remote control, <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> I like that he didn't even do any crowd work. Like he didn't come out and go, what the fuck was that? <laughs> he just launched right into his act. You know, I'm married and uh, my wife and people are like, there's vomit. <laughs> <laughs> we can all smell. Acknowledge the vomit. Yeah, you have to, that's the key, you know, you have to acknowledge your surroundings. All right. Is there, I'm curious, when, if ever, uh, did you feel like a bit or something you did crossed the line that you shouldn't have? Oh, I've had that experience a lot, you know. Um, I once was on a comic relief and I thought it'd be funny to dress up as Christ and do magic tricks. <laughs> um, you know. And I, I was the amazing Christo, it was like water to wine, wine to water, tap the deck and back to rice again. Um, I'm not claiming to be Jesus Christ, merely an illusionist that can recreate some of his most show starting and startling routines. And uh, I go out on Comic Relief and I'm dressed as Christ in this kind of a Bob Mackie Christ outfit. And as I'm bombing, there's a woman in the, back, in, the, in the balcony, she has a sign that says, I heart Bobcat. And as I'm going down in flames, she keeps lowering the sign. <laughs> and it was, it was great. It was just, just like the real Christ, you know. You were with the Galilean. It's like, no. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so often. And then I remember I walked by Billy Crystal as, I'm, as I just bombed. If you see the clip, they actually sweetened it because trust me, there was no laughs at all. And um, as I walked by Billy Crystal, he goes, you got some really big balls. <laughs> <laughs> so what, continuing this sort of line of questioning, what's the dumbest criticism you've ever received? Oh, um, well at one point or another, people have, you know, will, will always ask you to just you know, not be yourself or not do what you find entertaining. So, so when I first started doing stand-up, people would say, you know, everything I did was wrong. You know, they, um, you know, so, so, I, you know, I guess if you're a performer or any kind of creative person, you know, you, you know, f you're right. You know, don't, don't really listen. If, if folks don't like what you do, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not on the right path, you know. Uh, um, if you follow my advice, you can too be 50 years old and, and rent a house. Um. <laughs> what, and what, what's the smartest criticism you've ever received? I listen to my wife all the time. She, um, she you know, I made a movie called Sleeping Dogs Lie. It was called Stay. And, and she, I, I wrote the screenplay basically to see if I could actually write a screenplay that other people could read and go, okay, this works. I really didn't even have an intention of seeing it made because I was that frustrated with my uh, career at that point. And she read it a year after I'd written it and she goes, this is a good script, we should make it. I go, well, I don't have any money. She goes, well, we'll just start and people will help. So we shot it in two weeks with a crew from, from Craigslist. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm on Google, is that? It's all right. Am I crossing something there? <laughs> I'm such an old guy. Uh, if you guys can look me up on Friendster. I'm really into social media. Uh, and um, so, so she said, uh, you know, let's make it. And we just shot it like that. And then it ended up at Sundance. 
So, so her uh, opinion, I really do trust. But it's kind of funny, like this new movie, I, I'm really happy that folks have liked it so much and, 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 and the reviews have been very nice. But as, <laughs> I kind of did think that there was some stuff in this movie people would go, hey, wait, man, but nobody really put the brakes on me. <laughs> um, Shanda, can I, the star of the movie is in the audience. Do you mind if I introduce him? Joel Murray's mm -hmm. over there, folks. And he, you got Joel, uh, that's why Joel is in The Artist. Um, he's not allowed to talk. <laughs> Joel's also, he was in the movie The Artist. He played the cop that runs and gets the, uh, say, get, the dog goes and gets you. Yeah. And you guys were in a movie together, what, 85? Oh, yeah, I know Joel because we did a, a movie called One Crazy Summer. Uh, that, yeah! Some guy just said Bobcat Goldthwait. <laughs> Another person who thought I was dead. <laughs> um, uh, Joel and I met on a movie called One Crazy Summer, and uh, he's been a friend, and, and we've stayed in touch on and off over the years. And uh, my wife actually said, you know, Joel would be good for Frank, and so I sent him the script. And I didn't go, oh, I don't know if he could pull it off. I really had a eureka moment. I was like, oh, he'd be awesome. And I got really nervous that he wouldn't do the movie. I sent him the script. He thought I was sending him the script to play like a small part. And he said, who do you want me to play? And I go, oh, I want, I want you to be Frank. And he's like, the guy? And I go, yeah. And, um, you know, folks haven't seen the movie, but, but um, I, I, he's just so awesome in it. He's, he's, he's an amazing actor. I'm very excited that uh, he did the movie. Cool. Um, so there's a, there's a bit in, in the movie in which Roxy isn't just, when they're not just talking about stuff they hate, when she goes on this long explanation of why, exactly why and how Alice Cooper rules. So is, yeah. this, is this an opinion you share? Um, yes, I do think Alice Cooper rules. Uh, but, um, you know, when you're a teenager, you, you, you know, and you're trying to go against the status quo, you usually find something that the, the other kids in your class don't know about, aren't aware of, and that becomes your thing. And I thought Alice Cooper would be a perfect example of something that a kid now could actually go, look man, there, wasn't a, there wouldn't be a goth movement, there wouldn't be Marilyn Manson, there wouldn't be, you know, uh, you know uh, guys <laughs> wearing dresses on stage if it wasn't for Alice. So I thought that would make sense. So then, um, Alice and his manager were very helpful and they let us use some of the songs, so I was very excited. I was actually, I was surprised as I was watching the movie, there, I mean, what was your, what was your music licensing budget? Because there's some, there's some recognizable tunes in there. Yeah, you know what's funny is, is, is the music is, is a huge, it's really important to me and even though I make small movies, I, I, you know, I, I'm lucky that I've been getting these uh, big artists and, and I use music from all different sources. I, I use bands that are friends of my wife and daughters to, 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 to popular established artists. In fact, the, the score was composed by a kid that started as a PA on the set and um, he's a much better composer than a PA. He was a really crappy PA. <laughs> He is a good composer. The soundtrack's really, the score is excellent. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, you have retired from stand-up sort of the same way the Who have retired from touring. <laughs> yeah. I think they've had like nine farewell nine, tours yeah. at this point. So what's your current relationship to stand-up? You know, I, I, um, I thought I didn't like stand-up, but there's a connection that you make with a live audience that's... Um, I'm lying. I, I don't like stand-up. I just do it for the money. Um, whenever I'm on stage, it's just really to make money. No, I used to think that I hated it. What I, what, what I found out was that I kind of hated perpetuating the persona that people knew me for. And I didn't, it's not that I didn't like the character that people know me for. I, I have a soft spot for it. But, but, but to just keep doing this act that I came up with when I was in my early 20s as a 50-year-old guy, it just didn't seem to fit, you know. It, it, it seemed very false. It didn't seem very true. Well, I remember uh, in... God, do I sound like a pretentious load. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep going on this theme for a minute, because I remember uh, in the early 90s, you were doing a show on Fox that you very kindly had Too Much Joy be the musical guest for, and you were sort of emceeing a slate of stand-up comedians that I think you had hand-selected. And I just I remember two things very clearly from that night. The first is that when comedians sound check, they don't actually do any of their material. They just mumble, 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 yeah. mumble, because they're all paranoid mothers who are afraid like all the other comedians are going to steal their stuff. Oh no, the, no, no. The reason comics don't do sound checks is not because they're afraid that other comics are going to steal their stuff. They 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 want to make sure that the crew everybody laughs because so, ah. they don't think they're going to laugh the second time they hear okay. the jokes. The, well, thank you for explaining that. The second thing I remember was sitting in the green room while every comedian, while each comedian was on, all the other comedians watching backstage would just eviscerate whoever was on stage. <laughs> be like, oh my god, he's bombing, he's bombing, this is terrible, oh, he took that joke from this person. And then they'd come back into the green room and everybody was like, oh, you were great, you were great. It was, you're a weird group of people. But isn't that the way people act in general? Yeah, it was just, it was sort of like hyper that. It I was, thought it was a really good precursor to get me ready for South By. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing. Uh, <laughs> amazingly bad. All right. What, <laughs> one of your other movies, uh, World's Greatest Dad, starred Robin Williams, and you got on film, I think, like one of the most restrained and realistic Robin Williams performances ever. How did you do that? Well, you know, he, he's one of my best friends, so, so there's just a lot of trust between the two of us. But I did have a concern, you know, because even though we're best friends, I didn't know if he was going to listen to my direction. You know, the night before we went to make the movie, I got really nervous. I thought, like, I, I thought it was going to be like, hey, let's do it again. This time we're just going to take the scene really quiet. And he was going to say, I have an Oscar and you are in Hot to Trot. <laughs> I think we're going to do it my way, Bob Scratch, Goldfarb, but um, uh, it wasn't the case at all. It, he, he, would, uh, he would try anything I suggested. It was really wonderful. We, we're, we're hoping to make another movie together. I wrote a screenplay for he and I. And I'm, I'm curious, I mean, as I was, the other thing I kept thinking as I was watching the movie was, how the hell did you get this made? How do you go about financing a movie that's <laughs> this sort of a very, it's a very, very black comedy, this very right. dark satire. Uh, how do you, where do you get the money? Um, well, it's the same folks that finance, uh, uh, God Bless America financed The uh, World's Greatest Dad. That's uh, Darko, uh, Ted Ham is the, and uh, Sean McKittrick and, uh, they 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 um they 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 support the movies that I make but but um I I'm I'm sure a lot of getting that movie made was Robin attaching himself but but every time I make a movie you know the topics and subjects are kind of you know they're not commercial they're not mainstream I'm not I I I'm fully aware of that so so I'm lucky that I can make movies very small, so one, I get to make them all about the things that interest me, and, and two, that I don't, I don't have any note process, you know, I don't, it's not developed anywhere, it's just, I write these screenplays and then we go shoot them. Uh, last question for me, and then we'll, we'll take a couple of audience questions. Uh, I'm curious, um, Technology is changing, so you've been doing this. You've been making movies since the '80s, right? Uh, and now, you know, it's it's very common for movies to be in, streamed on demand before you get before they right. even get released to theaters. It's cheaper to make movies. Is the are these changes are they helping you realize your vision? Yeah, more I mean that's the whole deal. You know, the fact that um, you know the fact that now, you know that that's the thing. It's like when I see someone that, you know, if, if you don't like the movies that I make I, I don't I, you know I don't you know I, of course I wish everybody liked the movies I make but I hope that, that it inspires you to go make your own movies because because now you know you with just this you know a, a DV camera you know uh, anybody can make a movie that 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 um, that can have a run you know it's really exciting time so that's that's the thing I think is funny it's like sometimes my the um, my detractors get mad, like, who keeps letting Bobcat Goldthwait make movies? Harumph! But um, it's like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stop. 
<laughs> you know, because it's so accessible. So if, if it ends up with me being using my iPhone and making it with a, a, a paper puppets, I'm going to do it. You know, I like I love telling stories and there's no reason that all of us can't tell stories now. Well, thank you very much. Well, that was painless. Thanks for having me in the tent.